This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. My guest this week is someone who's familiar to a lot of listeners. Chris Ryan is the author of the best-selling Sex at Dawn, a book that came out at about the same time that A Renegade History of the United States came out. Chris and I have done a lot of projects together. I've been on his podcast several times. I've done a video with him for reason. And he's the host of the very popular Tangentially Speaking podcast. He's one of the leading figures in what's being called the intellectual dark web, the alt media universe that I've been operating in for a while. Chris and I came together because we had a shared interest in criticizing modern civilization. Although, as you'll hear, he and I come at it from different angles. Chris is in fact finishing a book right now called Civilized to Death, What Was Lost on the Way to Modernity. I met with him in his cabin in Topanga, California, a place that's important to both of us and that I always look forward to going back to. Here's my conversation with Chris Ryan. So I'm here with the last hippie, Chris Ryan, an old friend of mine. Been on his show a few times. I did an interview with you once before, a long time ago. We haven't seen each other in a couple of years. We are in Topanga, California, which is the only place in Los Angeles County that I like at all. So and you're I, a fucking hippie too, man. I, I Well, so I want to talk about that with you. And I'm hardly the last hippie. Come on. Um, I mean, I was born in 62. I, I was a, can't I was think a of child. another. Well, my friend Stanley, I think of him as just, the last there's hippie. There's two. Okay, He's there's, 85. There's two of you. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of hippies out there. I was in Santa Cruz last week. Met a lot of old hippies. I was just uh, two doors down from Ken Gizzi's old place. Oh, wow. Yeah. He's a hero of mine. Really? I mean, I love the big book, you know. Um, yeah. Sometimes a great notion. No, Electric Kool-Aid. Well, oh, except that's Tom. Oh, oh okay. Wait, Tom Wolf. Tom Wolf yeah. about the yeah, Gizzi people. about Gizzi and the yeah. pranksters. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there are more hippies? Oh yeah, there are a lot of hippies. Are there, I think I think there are neo hippies. That's what I was gonna ask. Yeah. I think the I think the sixties are returning, you know. You know, I think you and I have talked per- previously about how history isn't linear, it's cyclical. And so there are recurring things like, you know, the sexual liberation of the sixties had happened in the twenties and probably mm-hmm. I don't know, in the eighteen eighties or you know, there have been repeated uh, periods of liberation and constriction, you know, it's a breathing sort of, uh, cycle. And, uh, in your, in your book, you do the renegade history of America, is it, or US? United States, the United yeah. States. I, I can, I can never remember you and Zen. It's like a people's yeah, history of America or a people's history <laughs> we're both, of the USA. We're both United States, actually. United States. Okay. Um, you talk about the the sort of libertine roots of the country, which mm-hmm. you know people always assume it's a one one unidirectional movement toward liberation, and it's not. It can it it breathes and uh, goes mm-hmm. in and out. So, yeah. So I think I think a lot of things that are happening now are analogous to the sort of uh, liberation movements of the '60s, from you know tiny houses, van life. Uh, there's a lot of sort of back to the land kind of stuff, you know, people rethinking mm-hmm. urban living or um, uh, relationship, you know, polyamory mm-hmm. yeah. and LGBTQ rights. Uh, so many things. The Me Too movement can be seen as sort of a resurgent form of puritanical feminism <laughs> maybe yep. that's what i was right that's what i was going to say yes, yes. Um, you know but there but there is something really healthy in the Me Too movement at the core of it. So, uh, yeah, I think that the hippie movement never went away. When I hear people say, oh, the 60s, you know, was a failure, man. You know, obviously nothing worked. It's like, 
What do you mean nothing worked? The environmental movement, the civil rights, the women's movement, so many things that, that define the modern world came out of that historical moment. Mm -hmm. And we're still listening to the music, by the way, mm -hmm. you know, and the art and like so much of the 60s were high water marks in, in terms of uh, creativity. You know, I, I listened to Come Together the other day, the Beatles song. <laughs> mm -hmm. If that fucking song was on the radio today, we would be stopping our cars and going, mm -hmm. who, who is this band? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, I you agree. Know? Yeah. I'm not a huge or fan, Hendrix but I agree with that. Whatever. Oh, yeah, I mean, well, Hendrix, certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you were born in 62? Yeah, yeah 62. and I was born in 65. By the way, I think we're the two oldest podcasters. Is that right? <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Is I don't that think. Possible? I, I don't think there's ever. Has there ever been a podcast in oh, which both yeah. the host and the guest are over fifty? I don't think really? so. I think <laughs> this, we're, this is, is the first. first this is historic. Never. No, I've had Stanley on a bunch of times. <laughs> you know, our our combined age is one hundred and thirty something. Ooh, okay. You yeah. beat you beat our one hundred and seven. I like. I have lots of old guests on my show. I I yeah. like it. In fact, I sort of. I've got this idea for. Uh, you know, I do all these sub sub right. genre or I don't know what to call them sub you know Roma Toma all these different talking out my ass uh, what's Roma uh, ranting out my ass that's where I just like <laughs> answer emails and stuff um, but one of them is to interview people who are dying like in hospice wow and the idea of the podcast would be this will not be released while you're alive wow so fantastic I yeah do. I love that yeah. have you, wait have you started it um, I inadvertently I've started it. What happened was I had this guy on who's, um, I think in his late eighties and, uh, we talked for probably three and a half hours. It was fantastic. And he just told me all this amazing stuff about his family and his parents. And in the twenties, his parents essentially had an open relationship. Oh my God. And, um, wow. well, it wasn't really open. What happened was that his father and his father's best friend were business partners and while this guy that i was interviewing was away i think he was in the army or something and he came back and they sat down the father and the father's friend and the mother they all sat down with him and said listen uh, we just want to explain to you that while you were gone the father's friend fell in love with the mother and the father, rather than freaking out, just sort of said, well, you know what? You guys actually make a better couple anyway. But let's keep, you know, don't want to lose the friendship and the business. So they just sat this guy down, this 21-year-old guy coming home from the army and said, look, you know, you might notice now that, you know, Paul is sleeping with your mother and I'm sleeping <laughs> over there. And we just wanted you to know what was going on. Anyway, so he told me all these amazing stories and... And his his father was a very his father and his father's friend were very famous songwriters. Hmm. I mean, if I told you the name of the songs that they wrote, you would recognize them, but I can't tell you because the next day after we did this podcast, I got a uh, call from him and he said, "Listen, I really enjoyed our chat yesterday, and um, but I realized that I told you things that nobody in my family knows." And I really, I, I, I really sort of don't want this to come out. Would you mind just sitting on this until I die? Wow. <laughs> this is a very self-aware guy. And I said, well, of course. I mean, I'll, I'll delete it if you want. He said, no, no, just, just wait till I die. And then you can release it. So I thought about that. What a striking thing to say. And then I thought, what a, like, what a liberating premise for a conversation yeah with the right person yeah you know you don't want to be morbid and mm -hmm. and of course if somebody's like you know oh you know my brother raped me like you don't want to get into legal stuff or you know people don't have a chance to respond to their accuser i don't want to get into that but i want to get into you know i imagine there are people who are like well you know i never really loved my husband you know or i was talking to someone recently whose grandmother died recently and she said you know one of my great regrets is that i only had sex with your grandfather wow you know stuff like that I, where like what do you regret what? this is so great yeah. I, i'm like 
overwhelmed right now. I just yeah. think it's the most brilliant idea. And well, it's, if anyone wants to steal it, feel free, you know, because there are a lot of old people out there with a lot of things to say. And, God. you know, they're, uh, that's why I talk about it openly. You know, it's like whatever. It's I don't want to. Well, there's plenty to go around. Yeah, you know? exactly. Right. Exactly. And that, I think there's a big deficit in our culture of contact yeah. between old people yes. and young people. Yeah. And I think young people, you and I were talking about this a little before the we turned on the mics. I think that young people are starving for mentorship. Mm -hmm. And who better to give it to them than people, you know, who've been through it all. Yeah, if not mentorship. I mean, I don't, I don't like that idea, mentorship. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in graduate school, I sort of consciously avoided, you know, seeking a mentor. And a lot of people go to graduate school wanting a mentor. I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I want to learn from people, you know, either, yeah. you know, f as examples of what not to do or what to do. Um, but I, I just think that's a phenomenal idea. I love mm -hmm. that. Um, and I think, yeah, you're right. It is liberating. And, oh, boy, it like, gives me chills just thinking about it, right? Because, sure, if you're on your deathbed, you know, you can say a lot of stuff that you've never said before. Yeah. I hope you do that, a lot of that. I, I can't wait to hear that. Yeah, that's sort of my uh, my idea for this summer, to go go in the van and sort of drive around. And um, another reason I, I talk about it openly, besides the fact that other people are welcome to use the idea, is uh, that I hope people get in touch with me from hospices yeah. and you know people who work with uh, people at the late stages of life, because that's the problem you know how do you find right. the right person and and you know it has to be someone who's in full mental control mm -hmm. you know i don't want to intrude in anyone's right. privacy or take advantage of anyone but i mean the kind of person i envision is the sort of old rascal mm -hmm. i don't give a shit i'll tell you the way it was <laughs> you know that kind of person or and they don't need to be old i mean a lot of people are dying who are young they've got some terminal illness and um, I just want to give them a chance to, uh, you know, to speak with a freedom and clarity that maybe that moment provides, um, uniquely, you know? Yeah. And it's also, it makes dying interesting. <laughs> it makes dying, I don't know, it's, it's useful and, and worthwhile and, yeah socially well it's a unique moment in your life you know yeah. if you're lucky enough and i use that air quotes around that word lucky there but if you're lucky enough that you that there's a period in your life where you know you're dying right we all know kind of that we're dying but when you've received the diagnosis mm -hmm. when the doctor has sat you down right. and said look you got three to six months those three to six months can be really powerful and meaningful. Oh, yeah. You know, there's a lot that, you know, if, if you can go through those, you know, Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief and get to the acceptance, um, yeah, that's an incredible accomplishment. And I think, unfortunately, most of us don't really start to confront a lot of those things until... Uh, until it's triggered by, by something like that. Yeah. My father died in five days. He died last year uh, and it went from, he had a, an ache in his, I think his shoulder on Sunday and he was dead on Friday. Wow. Yeah. He didn't know he had fourth stage cancer. Oh my God. But, um, so he didn't have a chance, you yeah. know, and I don't know what he would have said. I mean, he was so racked with fear generally in life. My, my feeling is he just would have been so freaked out. Um, throughout it, he wouldn't have yeah. been able to speak about anything much. Even uh, even if it were six months? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's the other thing I'm thinking about is the, uh, I'm thinking about how I would respond. You know, would I just, I don't know. Would, I, would there be some sort of um, clarity and some calmness or would it just be panic? Because I, I'm always struggling with panic about everything. And so I would imagine that when I find out yeah. that I'm actually dying, Maybe not, though. I mean, when the thing actually hits, right, when you actually lose your house and when you actually go bankrupt, I've heard from people who've gone through that, that it's actually the moment when they become calm and relaxed. That's it. You got nothing yeah. to lose. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had an experience. I don't know if we've talked about this, but years ago, um, April of 1989, so I was 27 years old, 
uh, I I got stung by a scorpion, and the guy told me that it was fatal. Oh, and I won't recount the story here. If people want to hear it, they can. Uh, I I did it on a thing called a show called Risk. Oh yeah, uh, and uh, you know they added sound effects and everything, so <laughs> it was pretty cool. Uh, you can find it on Risk, or if not, it's on my webpage, uh, chrisryanphd.com. And um, anyway, it was, a, it was a really intense night. I was tripping. I was in Guatemala. There was all this crazy shit. But I believe for like an hour and a half or so, I thought I was dying. Hmm. So I you know, thought I was saying my last words. You know, I, I sort of thought of how my friends were going to take this and, you know, what they were going to think and, uh, you know, looked back on my life and, you know, you know, regrets and satisfactions. I went through that whole process. Obviously, I didn't actually die physically, but um, I got a taste of it. And the thing about panic is panic's exhausting. Yeah. So you might panic for a while, but after... A while you'd be too tired, you know. You'd just be too <laughs> fucking tired to panic anymore. Huh. And uh, I don't know. I've done a pretty good job of it for fifty-two years. <laughs> <laughs> but you're pacing yourself. <laughs> yeah, right. I spread them out. You know, over the day, I have like you know my seven panic attacks. I make sure you know one's at nine, one's at noon, one's at three <laughs> after dinner. That's good. That's very civilized. Before I go to bed. Yeah, yeah. it's very civilized, very orderly, mm-hmm. bourgeois. Um, so. Um, beautiful idea. I can't wait for that. I think I want to steal it. Go ahead. If I can. Well, if anyone wants to do that with me, please, please let me know. I, yeah. w- I would be very interested. Um, so, yeah, the 1960s. Yeah, I heard the birds. I just heard the birds chirping. And I hope the mics picked it up because, you know, we're in Topanga and the doors are open and it's we're surrounded by trees and... It's very rustic here. If anyone's been to Topanga, they know what I'm talking about. I, I have a story about Topanga. Um, which is that I moved to LA with my wife and my son nine years ago and basically hated it because I'm from Berkeley, you know, and we're the, we're the original hippies, the OG hippies up there. And I was used to living in places like Topanga and I decided to leave my wife and I, um, freaked out, screaming, driving around LA, just thinking the light my life was over and I sort of randomly drove up Topanga Canyon Road and suddenly I saw the trees and I felt like I was home Mm. and I called my wife and I said why the fuck didn't you ever bring me here this is where I want to (laughs) be so I kind of left home and found home simultaneously but um it's also Topanga is less civilized Right. Yeah. I would imagine that's why you like it. I've been coming here since the seventies. Yeah. My aunt moved here in mm. the late seventies. And, uh, so we would come out, I, I grew up on the East coast and we would come out and visit, you know, every year or two. And I hated LA. Mm-hmm. I hated everything about LA. Uh, I hated it symbolically i hated it in actuality i hated the dirty air and the traffic and the schemers and the scammers and the fucking ambition and like everything that i dislike about america you know la was just full of um but then we would come up to topanga to visit her and i was like fuck this works Mm -hmm. everything just just the curvy road Mm -hmm. and the the sense that you're separated in a way and the air is clean coming up from the ocean and the vibe and the people I met up here, you know, you're right. I'm, I'm a hippie at heart and my aunt was a real hippie. Hmm. Um, Hmm. Was she uh, an inspiration? I mean, well, you know, yeah, she was in the sense that, you know, my parents, my mother's the oldest sister and my aunt's the youngest kid of five. So there are five. My mom's the oldest. She's the youngest. And I think there's like a maybe a 10 year gap or a little more maybe. And so my mom was a little was well by personality and also age. She wasn't going to catch that wave in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Um, But my aunt caught it. So my aunt had the VW bug with flowers painted (laughs) on it. And, you know, and, you know, my parents listened to Frank Sinatra and Perry Como and that kind of shit. And then we go visit my aunt and she was she had Crosby, Stills, Nash mm-hmm. and Young and the Beatles and the Stones. And and even as an eight year old kid, I was like, 
that's my music. Yep. That's what I, that's my jam right there. And also, you know, she had all these sexy friends walking around, mm. brawless, and, you know, oh. you know, it was like I would go to their house and I was a little kid, but I could definitely see, like, this is the way I want to live. Everybody's <laughs> barefoot and the food was really good. None of this TV dinner bullshit, you mm-hmm. know, like, you know, she grew food in the garden and they had a big dog and, the kids were running around naked and it was just like free yeah. and happy and funky. And hmm. yeah. So I, uh, yeah. So you would, you could say she was an inspiration or you could also say that was just my nature. And I recognized it when I saw it. Right. You know? Sure. Yeah. Were you raised in a suburb by the way? As a kid? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess we were, uh, like, I mean, I moved a lot as a kid, so it's complicated to talk about, but why did you move a lot? My dad thought he was in the military. Thought he was in the military? <laughs> he just liked uniforms, really. Come on. No, I'm kidding. Oh. I'm kidding. Um, yeah, he was, um, it was, he was upwardly mobile, basically. Well, he was not in the military. No, no, okay, no okay. I'm joking. Uh, he, uh, you know, he kind of switched career paths and then, like, would, like, raise, go up quickly in, in one and then switch to another one and... A lot of that required moving or even just within the same town, you know, he, he was making much more money. So they would move from the, you know, the townhouse, they bought a house and then they bought another house and different school districts and moving around and all that. Um, but I went to three different high schools and I think we figured, my sister and I figured it out once we'd lived in like, I don't know if it was like 15 houses, you know, in mm in 20 years or something did you ever live in a place you would want to live in now no yeah no right you hated where you lived basically well i didn't hate everywhere i mean i i so most of until i was 15 we were in western pennsylvania mostly Hmm. near pittsburgh beaver falls was Mm -hmm. the main area which is about an hour north of pittsburgh and this was in the 70s so it wasn't now i hear pittsburgh's a nice place right but in the 70s it was industrial wasteland oh, God, the rivers yeah. were on fire and that was the worst yeah for pittsburgh yeah but you know where i was was pretty rural so there's a lot of um a lot of forest uh i had friends who had horses and mm-hmm. not like fancy connecticut horses but like you know more cowboy kind of vibe And uh, lots of open space. You know, I'd I'd go with a friend of mine who was into hunting and trapping and stuff. I'd go with him on his trap lines. And so it was kind of a rural scene there. Not Mm -hmm. not so suburban, but where I lived was suburban. Um, You know, we had a swimming pool and a big house and, you know, cut the grass and all that shit. And then we moved to Connecticut. Mm. You know, so like in Western PA, I was like you know one of the top two or three students in the class in terms of just you know right intelligence yep. and whatever because most of them were you know the children of factory workers and farmers and stuff sure. right and um you know i grew up with lots of books and you know intellectualish parents my father was a professor at penn state when i was born oh uh, in grad school actually not like a full professor what did he teach uh british uh english literature oh yeah huh um, and my mom was a teacher too. So I grew up with books. So I don't mean to say I'm, I was some genius. I just mean like oh, of course. studying was of course. easy for yeah. me. Right. And then we moved to Connecticut, Fairfield, Connecticut, <clears throat> which is the most civilized place in America. Unbe- uh, the wealthiest County. Yeah. In, in America. That is, that is American civilization as you would define it. Right. I mean, that's the, pin- the well, pinnacle, see, the pinnacle, the apotheosis. Well, see, this is the thing about defining civilization in this book I'm working on that you see the the manuscript on the stack table of papers of right next to me, which yeah. is his manuscript, everyone, if you're worried there about Chris finishing this thing. <laughs> I, I actually see it. I was supposed to be working on it today, but it's your fault yeah. or not. Well, me too. <laughs> I'm supposed to be working on a book too. Uh, uh, what was my point? So oh, in defining civilization, the thing, one of the things I'm trying to do in this book is show that you know, how we define civilization in such partial ways. And so when we're talking about civilization, the costs and the benefits, we need to look at the whole shebang, not just Fairfield County. We also have to look at West Virginia. We have to look at, you know, the the, the extreme poverty of mm. Appalachia. We mm. have to look at the toxic waste sites. We have to look at the military bases that are polluting the aquifer with their fucking 
toxic runoff. So it's the whole thing. I would say Fairfield is the pinnacle in many ways of American civilization. That's where you, the, you know, the golf courses and the fancy, you know, not the horses like in Pennsylvania. Here you've got the stables. and the, Right, but which part do you hate the most? I, I'm not that into hate. I, I, yeah, you I'm are. more sad. You hate it, don't you? No, well, no, and that's another thing that's happening with this book, and, and it's one of the most interesting things I've learned in this book is I, I came to this, I, I was writing about um, wealthy people, and uh, there's this concept that I introduce in the book I hope my editor allows to stay, which is, uh, it's sort of a, a parody of a psychological diagnosis, RAS, if you suffer from RAS, rich asshole syndrome <laughs> and so I was looking at rich assholes and and why rich people tend to be assholes and I was coming at it with the assumption that it's that rich the assholes are willing to do things that decent people aren't willing to do to get money so assholes are willing to lie and cheat and backstab and do all that sort of ambition driven bullshit that allows them to get into these positions but what I found was that, especially upon self-reflection, is that there are times in my life where I have been a rich asshole. Like, I remember the first time I was in India, uh, and I was sitting in this restaurant, and I was eating a curry, and there were these kids. I was at a table sort of outside, and there were these kids standing about three feet away from me just staring at my food. And... I was annoyed and the waiter came over and shooed them away and they went across the street and stared. And I, I was going through this, like I'm annoyed cause I just want to eat my fucking curry. And those kids are bugging me. They're, they're interfering with my ability to enjoy this, but those kids are starving. Mm -hmm. And, and yet I'm still annoyed. And I'm glad the waiter came and chewed them away. I don't want to see them. I don't want to deal with them. And so I, I thought a lot about like, what are the psychological mechanisms that we generate to protect ourselves from viewing the truth of these severe injustices and inequalities in our world? And wealthy people are... Um, encased in this psychological scar tissue and what happens is that they end up being isolated and alone and miserable and so it's not just that assholes are willing to do things to get rich it's that being rich makes you an asshole and there's a lot of psychological research to back this up there uh, this guy um in, at berkeley um Dasher, I, I can't remember his name right now. He's a strange name. He does all this fascinating research where he shows, for example, he'll he'll put a, an old lady at a crosswalk waiting to cross the street, and he's got you know video cameras monitoring, and he looks at which cars stop for her and which just blow through. The more expensive the car, the more likely it is to blow through. People with money become entitled. He does these things with Monopoly where he'll randomly, do you know about this research where he randomly chooses two students to, um, to play a game of Monopoly? And what he does is he says, okay, look, we're going to flip a coin. Whoever, gets, whoever wins the coin toss, you're going to be the rich guy and the, whoever loses is going to be the poor guy. So we flip the coin. Okay, you're the rich guy. You start out with $5,000. The other guy starts out with $1,000. You get two dice. The other guy gets one dice. You, you know, get, you, whatever. You've got all these advantages, right? Now, there's a bowl of pretzels next to the table. While they're playing, the guy who's been chosen to be the rich guy, who's winning. Of course he's winning. He was born rich, right? He's got two dice. He's got all the advantages. He eats a lot more of the pretzels than the other guy. If he spills pretzels on the floor, he doesn't pick them up. Right. So there's all these attendant behavior patterns that come with being privileged hmm. that in the end work against us. Okay. 
<laughs> I mean, that's here a lot. we go. That's a lot. <laughs> so people who have listened to us talk before know that we have some differences on politics. Um, oh, geez, do we? Yeah, uh, you don't remember, um, which is fine. Uh, I, I just find it interesting that we both are literally child children of the '60s. We both have um, attachments, emotional attachments to what we think of as the 60s to places like Topanga, to hippies generally, to that sort of a, to the counterculture of the 60s, different ways of thinking that arose during that time. Uh, but um, the politics is interesting because it's, you and I, I think have just taken different means uh, to get to where we wanna be, to get, to get back to Topanga, <laughs> right? Um, in other words, for society to get back, right? So that's right. where the politics comes in. So uh, let's see, how do I unpack that? Um, what was the truth about those children in India that you didn't understand at the time? You knew they were poor. You knew they were starving, right? Yeah. You weren't stupid. It wasn't a truth about them. It was a truth about myself. Oh, which is what? Which is that in that context, I was unimaginably wealthy to them. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't accustomed to thinking of myself as wealthy, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I had to deal with the fact that I had enough money in my money belt to, you know, pay off the debts of one of their families mm -hmm. and liberate them for life sure. or build a school or build a medical clinic yep. or, you know, whatever. Sure. I had the wherewithal to totally change lives, mm -hmm. but I wasn't going to do it. Okay. Um, because I, you know, would rather spend it on, you know, whatever, traveling around India and, you know, buy some hash and, then go to Thailand and, you know, whatever, which things that to them would have looked frivolous probably. And, um, you know, which in a way is kind of similar to me saying, oh, you're going to buy a fucking yacht and you're not going to, you know, help pay off the college, you know, debts of all these kids in South Central or you're not going to, mm -hmm. you know. So what I'm saying is that it's a way to think of, how it, it's a question of scale and and that in order to deal with that stuff i had to deaden some of my senses i had to i was choosing ignorance mm -hmm. i was choosing blindness right because it's just too painful so the truth am i right was a moral truth that you weren't aware of that you should have given your money to the kids it's not that I should have, it's that I was in the presence of pain that I was choosing not to feel. And in choosing not to feel it, you lose a part of yourself. And the, the truth about myself that I'm referring to is that I also was suffering. And this is what I get, get at in Civilized to Death. Mm. You look, you look at psychological life satisfaction surveys of people. Their life satisfaction increases, uh, correlated with income, increases to about $75,000 per year in hmm. America, hmm. right? After that, it levels off or starts to go down. Hmm. There, is no, there is no increased benefit, psychologically speaking, to having more than a hundred grand a year income. Now, we're told that's hard to believe because the, all the propaganda of capitalism in Western society is telling us more money, everything's going to be better. But more money, more problems. You talk to people who have more money, they're not happier. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've, I've seen that anecdotally in personal experience, and I've also you know, read the research. So I got to the point where it's like I always thought that capitalism was like a poker game at your place. You, me, Daniele, and Rogan, <laughs> we all play poker. Rogan wins. Sam Harris is not coming. He's, <laughs> he, he's not invited. He, I'm sure he sucks at poker. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, you and me lose. Those two guys go home with more money, 
right? And so it's a zero sum kind of thing. But when I read this research and I, I started to see that, wait a minute, even the guys who win at the table are losing. We're not playing poker at your place. We're playing poker in a casino. We're all losing. How are they losing? How, how, do, the, how do the rich lose? Because they're not happy. Well, okay, but what's the connection? The connection is that we're told to believe, and, and most of us do believe, that more money is a better life. Mm-hmm. But what actually happens is that people get more money and they don't have a better life. They have a lonelier life. In fact, if you look at life satisfaction, what you find are the people, the countries with the highest life satisfaction Hmm. tend to be poor countries with high religious belief. What makes people happy? The number one factor in terms of happiness is community. Do you feel embedded in a loving community? Which, and you know, my shtick is all relating everything back to hunter gatherers Mm -hmm. we survived as a species by having strong interdependent intimate communities that's Mm -hmm. what we do that's what we're good at and so it makes perfect sense that that's the thing that would push our buttons right so what makes us really miserable is being isolated Mm -hmm. solitary confinement is the highest you know form of punishment we have yep People, prisoners would rather be in a cell with rapists and murderers than alone. Yep. Uh, we're, we're, we need that contact with other human beings. So um, what happens when you have money is a lot of money. You're suspicious of everybody. What's their agenda? Do they really like me or they just want to hang out on the boat? Do they really? Are they, what, what's your pitch? What are you pitching me? What's going on? How are you trying to use me? You know? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I have a, a good friend, a mutual friend. I won't say who. It, well, that's Rogan. It doesn't matter. It's okay. Rogan because it's this. This doesn't reflect poorly on him. Uh, I was going to do a show one day, and uh, this woman had just sent me a, a picture of herself naked, and she was really hot. Wow! And I, I need to be richer. <laughs> it's, it's not because I'm rich. I'm not rich. Look at my. You, I need to be more. You famous. see what? You see where I live? I'm not fucking rich. I'm in a fucking You're more hunting famous. cabin here. <laughs> Uh, no, you need to write a book about sex is what you need to do. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of did just in the wrong way. But yeah. Anyway, yeah. So, so anyway, she sent me this picture and she was super sexy and I was like, Whoa, Joe, look at this. This just came in. And I showed it to him and he said, it's a trap. <laughs> wow. It's <laughs> like, what do you mean? It's a trap. So like, yeah, it's a trap, man. Don't, don't respond. It's a trap. I was like, yeah, that's what it's like to, to have that much yeah. coming at you. Sure. You know, you got to be suspicious. You got to worry. Thank God I'm not at that level. I just like, I say thanks. You right. Know? And it was no trap. She was in Australia. Like what, what trap? What's, you know, there's no, there's no trap. So I don't know why I'm telling that story. What the fuck? Well, no the isolation. Point? No. I, so I'm actually agreeing with yeah. you so far on this stuff. Um, you seem disappointed. Did I, did I, <laughs> did I agree? With me. No, 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 I'm, no, I don't. <laughs> no, see, I actually seek community. I've, I've known this for a long time. I know that it makes me happy. I think you're yeah. right. I know you're right about me. Okay. And I think yeah. you're, and I think you're right about a lot well, of Well, psychological people. Yeah. research shows that's, that's oh, the thing. I know you're right about me. Yeah. I'm positive. I mean, and that's, I've sort of been very deliberately doing that in the last couple of years. Cause especially in, in Salem, Oregon, where I live half the time. I've been very deliberately, consciously developing a community there because I had none in L.A. You know, that's one of the worst yeah. things about L.A., right? Right. Is it? it's a much more isolating place for some reason, for many reasons, than most other places I've lived in. I lived in New York City for 17 years, had a fabulous, you know, group of friends and a right. community there that I could always tap into. Right. In L.A., I was just, I felt like I was on the moon the entire time. The entire time. You know, I'd have friends, but they'd live, you know, an hour away or something. Yeah. Um, but in a place like Salem, and by the way, I think the future is small cities like that. I don't know yeah. if you've talked about this or know yeah, about this, no, right? I definitely have. I'm yeah. very excited about that, right? Um, because when you and I were growing up, it, it looked like cities, cities like that were just going to, were dead and were going to stay dead forever, where there's this hollow core downtown surrounded by this ring of bland suburbs, right? Now the opposite is happening. So I've been in many, many cities like Salem. I was just in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is the same thing. It, I used to live right near there. Oh, right. So it used near to be intercourse, to- PA. That's right. And Blue Balls. Amish, yeah. Blue Balls, PA. Blue Balls. And, La- and, uh, yeah. and intercourse are right next to each other. Right. But, you Burning know, Lancaster hands. in the 80s and 90s, it's where my girlfriend's from. Um, mm. Is she Amish? No. Um, <laughs> uh, worse, Episcopalian. Yeah. <laughs> 
um, the Amish are very sexy. Have you noticed that? I mean it. I'm serious. Uh, They're gorgeous. Really? I find that when I go there and you see them in their, the, whatever they call that outfit the men wear, especially the men, I think, and the hats. Oh, you're into and, the dudes. They're kind of like sexy um, Hasidim. Like if, <laughs> if Hasidim were sexy, they would be Amish. You don't see that? I think they're very yeah. beautiful. I mean, just the whole idea. I mean, the Hasidim are the least sexy people on yeah, earth as the far least, as I'm Yeah, concerned. absolutely. Yeah. Right. But the, you don't... I used to work with Hasidim in New York. I was in the Diamond District. Oh, good God. Yeah, that was my, my wow. gig. Have you ever noticed that Hasidim are always rushing? They're yeah. always like walking... Headlong. They're just walking really fast. We used to call them the night Riders. Yeah. Because they have those long coats. <laughs> they're always hats. going somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and they need to get there right away. Making money. Small yeah. cities, small cities, small Lancaster, cities Salem. Towards, There's yeah. a uh, Dar Williams, the folk singer. You know, she has mm. this book out. Um, in fact, I want to interview her about this. She, of course, she's been to every small city in the country, mm. you know, 10 times performing. And that's what she has seen, in fact, in the right. last 10 to 20 years. Right. This tremendous revival of small cities and a decentralization. That's the best thing. You no longer have to live in New York or L.A. to right. be a creative person. There's right. all these other places to live. And there's all sorts of decentralization going on. So. Um, I hear Fargo is a really cool yeah, town. Yeah, Fargo. Yeah. They're popping up all over the place. You know, I grew up in, in a small city like that, Berkeley, right? And I always thought this is the best because it's big enough for there to be an energy and a cosmopolitanism, but it's small enough where you can walk around and you can know people and feel connected to the place and all that. Anyway, civilization, Chris, I think um, I'm more sanguine about it than you are, right? Mm -hmm. I think we're we're headed in a actually a pretty good direction and i think the 20s was a great decade the 60s was a great decade relative to others but i think if you ignore vietnam but i think the good point excellent point it wasn't so great for the vietnamese and for the 50,000 dead american soldiers but i think this coming decade might be the best of them all hmm. i think in fact we're living in it i think it is right now i know you're gonna hate this this is definitely the best time to be alive. <laughs> I, I don't see, it seems indisputable to me, actually. <laughs> well, you know, anytime something seems indisputable, I think you need to look at yourself in the mirror. Yeah. Uh oh. You need to really think about things. Okay. Cause, so let, cause then you're talking, you're based in your, your argument on faith, you know, uh, sure. everything's just, Oh yeah, no, of course. I mean, that's just yeah. a, yeah, but I want to, no, that was sort of a, but a lot of people, that was a provocation to begin it a discussion. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cause no, of course I want to hear your take on that. But, um, so, Okay, let's do this. What do you so? What do you not like? What do I not like? You mean about the present moment? Or yeah, I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot, and you talk about this all the time. But let's yeah. get let's get a nice a shopping list here. You know what? What do you what do you really not like about what's happening now? What's happening right now? So you're putting me in in the position of curmudgeon in chief. Well, this is but, what you've been doing a lot lately, right? Well, and you've been criticizing my argument about civilization. I, by the way, I don't have any issue with that. I mean, it's fine. I'm yeah. a critic. I, I criticize yeah. all day long, every day. Right. So that's fine. It's just, it's just that I think you and I dislike different things. That's right. All. Right. Um, I, I mean, the, the thing is, well, I wish the book were out and we could talk, you know, sometime we'll talk about the book when it's out and people can read the argument in full. But, you know, the. What I'm arguing against is that I think a lot of the conversations about civilization are limited by the fact that most people don't really know what civilization is. They're they're working from the propaganda, the progress, the myth of progress, eternal progress. Everything's getting better all the time. So it seems indisputable to people that now is the best time ever simply because they're thinking within the framing of things are always getting better. So now must be the best time logically that makes sense but of course you know somebody with a sophisticated sense of history like you have knows that that's not the case that they're there things get better and then they get much much worse and, mm -hmm. and in one part of the world they're better and other part of the world Prime example worse. 1920s we're big fans of it what followed the 1920s the depression and then and we're the big, worst war in, in human history well and Anna, are, are we big fans of it because economic inequality was horrible in the 20s right racial uh, relations were very bad in the 20s um you know other parts of the well, world were was mixed on both those counts but you know, I mean, because well, that was, was also the, the 20s was also the, the great age of jazz. In, yeah. Which was yeah. an interracial phenomenon. People right. dancing together, blacks and whites in nightclubs right. across the country. Right. 
And in terms of inequality, maybe, sure, there were very wealthy people for the first time, you know, sort of the great robber barons at that level for the first time. But there was also general rising, a rising tide. I mean, the poor in the 1920s were richer, this is absolutely true, than in the 1900s. They had more stuff. There was just more stuff. Well, having more stuff and wealth aren't necessarily the same Okay, thing. but in terms of material wealth, right, right? You would grant that there's greater material wealth in the 20s. I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert on this, okay. on this area. What I... How about now? What I've read many, many times is that economic inequality was extreme in the 20s. And it's only been reached again now. Uh, sure. So again, there's inequality, right? <clears throat> and then there's how well the poor are living. Right. So those are two different concerns. Right. And so okay. So what? Are, uh, and again, like, are we talking about America? Are we talking about the world? Go either one. I, I'm ready to talk about both. Uh, well, I think the the if we're talking about whether this is the best time to be alive, I think one of the major things we have to look at is that this is pretty much everything that that we love about right now is unsustainable so um you know the um the, this climate change is just out of control um the the fires are getting worse and worse and worse you look at the insurance payments and the disasters even just in the u.s it's off the charts um the shit is hitting the fan so if we're looking and saying this is the best time to be alive get back to me in 10 years. It might not look so fucking sunny, mm -hmm. you know, when we're looking at it from 10 years or, from now. Or too sunny, I guess is what you're saying. Or too sunny, yeah. <laughs> That's what you're too saying. Too sunny, yeah. too rainy, too... <laughs> I, I disagree, but okay. Too yeah. much rain, yeah. not yeah. enough yeah. rain, whatever. Uh -huh. um, so I think that's that's a pretty major uh, cloud on the horizon. Uh, you know, I think that, um, that people have less leisure time than ever. Mm. I think... Mm -hmm. The technology in our lives mm -hmm. is pernicious and aggressive mm -hmm. and toxic. Mm -hmm. I think um, the, the, mm -hmm. the research in kids who grew up with screens, with smartphones and all that, is that they score lower on every measure of psychological and physical health much more diabetes, much more obesity, much more depression, suicide, um, social isolation, deep unhappiness. Uh, you know, the, I think the opioid crisis in America, as you and I were talking about, you know, when I was making coffee, addiction is, as Gabor Mate put it beautifully, addiction isn't the problem. Addiction is an attempt to respond to the problem. Right. Right. That's what so I think. Yeah. what is the problem? Right. The problem is we live in a meaningless well, world. <laughs> we live, yeah. we live lives in the absence of the sacred and a life in the absence of the sacred is deeply unsatisfying. And so people turn to all sorts of nonsense. They're going to, you know, they're going to be optimal physical specimens and take all these supplements and do all this CrossFit and oh, I'm going to be a monster. I'm perfect. And I'll never die. That was, or, a, that was a little um, sub dig at on it, I take it. No, no, no. <laughs> I love on it. I'm an alpha brain person. Uh, no, not not on it specifically. Just just that sort of, you know, our Tim Ferriss and sure. yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. and again, not Tim Ferriss specifically. I don't want to you know give anyone I, I, shit. But there's this there's this industry. Yeah, what's it called? There's an. I was invited onto a podcast about that industry. The, um, the optimization. No, there's the, a, yeah, there's a Silicon Valley term for this thing um biohacking yeah and there's another one anyway I yeah there are lots of terms yeah and, right and the whole you know it's like this whole sort of um i don't know but anyway my point is that that's like yep. a religious impulse it, it's it's a place where people are looking for meaning and mm -hmm. and uh escaping the sort of existential despair that i think a lot of people feel mm -hmm. and there are other play i mean you know there there's lots of other um people are selling other answers to sure. this problem but but the point is that the culture is is not satisfying on a, on a deep level you people said, are working harder than ever and they're feeling less and less I, satisfied with their lives i don't know i mean i don't know if, how true that is first of all but you said something that was that caught my attention there i think you said what people are lacking is the sacred 
Is that yeah. right? Yeah, we, what, we live but then in you, the absence but, of the sacred. But then you called these things that are bad religious impulses. Yeah, because I think, so we, what's the difference? I think we have a religious impulse. I think we, when I say religious loosely, I mean, I think we seek meaning. We seek some meaning that endows our lives with uh, significance mm-hmm. beyond personal satisfaction and pleasure and ambition. Sure. And... Um, but you're saying it sounded like the sacred is a positive category for you. Yeah, I think I think. But the, and it's different. There needs to be something sacred, and it's different than worshiping a, a supplement that'll make your muscles bigger. Yeah, so I, I. What's I think, the sake? What's the good sacred in the, versus that bad sacred? Well, I, I think that that is the responsibility of a healthy culture to. No, but what is it? Like, how do you define the good sacred? Well, that, that's what I'm saying. I think that it's a cultural definition. I think that in a given culture, um, you know, for the Huichole Indians, for example, uh, who have the, the um, practice of going into the desert every year and searching for the peyote cactus mm-hmm. buds, and during that trek through the desert every night when they sit around the fire they take turns uh, openly confessing to mistakes and transgressions that they'd made in the past year and cleansing themselves and being forgiven and f- reestablishing a bond of truth and honor with each other i think that is sacred yep. That is a so sacred doesn't need to be a pantheon of but gods. Why? Why? Why do you consider that sacred? Because it reinforces what is meaningful and uh, and functional in that society. Um, you know, in ancient Greece, the Eleusian mysteries, and you know, going and and imbibing. Uh, forget what the, it wasn't soma was it that they called it I, soma is the 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 vedic um name for it but it's probably uh psilocybin mushrooms mm-hmm. um that was a sacred rite that reestablished the connection i, th- I think anything and, and it could be religious too i mean i know people who find meaningful um positive energy in their religion so you know, I, I'm not a big fan of religion per se because I think it's been corrupted and politicized and, you know, in most cases it's turned into something else. But I think that uh, that there is a hunger for the sacred. And when we don't find it, we turn to um, to substitutes and, and that the culture feeds on that by selling us things whether it's you know yoga classes or you know i was just joking because i always i always sort of you know assume this curmudgeonly pose and i did a yoga class yesterday for the first time in 10 Mm. years or something and and I, i tweeted something like if someone will start the no fucking namaste yoga school i'll <laughs> yeah, sign oh, up because yeah. i love yoga i love the workout i love the stretching and all that but i don't want to hear spiritual enlightenment bullshit from some 26 year old who just came back from her first trip to india i i'm not here for that there's lots of yoga classes like that they're called power yoga you oh can, you see, can find them but all that's, over but that's the other side of it i, <laughs> I don't know, want freaking right. power yoga right. either i just want like <laughs> come hang out just we're yoga. friendly we do yoga <laughs> right you know we're not gonna turn you into a superhero and right. or a you know namaste you to death it's just like you know let me choose what where my sacredness is. but anyway so i think the culture feeds that hunger in lots of different ways i think people get it in sports you know like i'm a fucking packers fan till death you know like all oh, right yeah. dude and then you know circling back to where we started in a way i think that in the world of podcasting hmm. there is an almost hmm. like a tribal identity hmm. that forms around different podcasts Absolutely. and podcast personalities yeah because a lot of young men who are form the bulk of my audience and yours probably mm-hmm. are searching for that kind of um, belonging, that sense of belonging to some something bigger than themselves, mm-hmm. 
which can get people into street gangs. It gets them into the military. You know, I'm yes. a fucking seal. I'm the elite. You know, many are called, few are chosen. Like all that kind of shit. Like we all, we all yearn to be in a, you know, the the band of brothers and that kind of thing. And so people are like, you know, I'm a Sam Harris follower, and no, oh, I'm a Jordan Peterson follower, and they get. You can see that that it's become more than just an intellectual resonance. Oh yeah, because they get so emotionally attached to, you know, if somebody disses someone else, and you know, then there's all this brouhaha on the internet about it, and it's it's interesting. Yeah, no, you're completely right about that. So, but isn't it also fantastic that this is happening? That you and I are doing what we're doing, and this, and all these people have found community around it. Well, they found a, a sim, simaculum. Is that the word? Sim, simulacrum. Simulacrum of community. Oh, but, so but oh, it isn't really community. Why not? Well, because they don't know each other. But they do. They get to know each other. Well, if they happen to have a, you know, a, a Thad Russell meetup in. They do, and and don't yours? Don't your fans do that? Sometimes, but but I mean. This 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 online community thing again. It's a weird. No, know, but they're meeting in person though. Often. Sometimes, or or they're sometimes, talking online. But if I've got fifty thousand people listen to an episode of my podcast, there might be five who ever meet each other. I mean, it's not. There's not a stadium full of people who all like go out for dinner after listening to an episode. Oh, it's certainly not the same as what you and I are doing now. That's face my to point. Face. Sure. Just like you know, watching some chick, you know with a dildo online isn't the same thing as having sex <laughs> sure so we say a community but see this see this is the pattern that i see over and over again and if you ask me like what do i hate about civilization this maybe this gets to the point mm -hmm. i think that what civiliz civilization does is it takes away something that's free and works great and creates the hunger for it now because it's missing and then it sells something that is uh, a, uh, a, an insufficient, inferior version of the thing they took away in the first place. And in this case, you're talking about community? It sells community? Community, sex, food. I mean, that's the life. I mean, civilization spreads, pushes hunter-gatherers out of their environment or destroys their environment, and then puts them to work on the fucking banana farm and gives them you know united fruit company currency that they can use to buy shitty pre-processed food in the company store at inflated process uh, prices and be in debt their entire lives that's what civilization does as it spreads throughout the world and it does it to us too and you know we can't you, you can't opt out you're not allowed to just go buy a piece of land and farm and have chickens you got to pay property tax well, that means you got to have money. Where are you going to get the money? You got to have a job. Uh, you got to have a job. That means you don't have time to take care of your chickens in your garden. Oh, all right. So you're in the fucking game. You can't opt out of the game. Well, wait, hold on now. So you can, you can, you can start a farm and have chickens and sell the eggs at the farmer's market. And I ain't going to pay your fucking property taxes. Well, people dude. are doing Do the it. numbers. People Do the are numbers. doing it. I mean, that's who's at the farmer's market. No, right? that's the wife at the farmer's market. The husband's got a job in town or, you know, they're being a farmer isn't an easy thing to do. No, I, I know. I know some of them are doing I, it. I know people who do that, but um, okay. My point is you can't opt out. I, I just, there's a whole chapter about this. Have you ever read James C. Scott? Interesting question. Yeah, sure. He's, he's important. He, super important for me. Yeah, really yeah. interesting guy. Oh yeah. yeah. I have the, the art of not being governed yeah. is very, it's about this. It's, oh, yeah. it's about people who tried to not be involved oh, in yeah. civilization and civilization is having none of it. Mm -hmm. You must, you're compelled to be involved. So opting out, I'm all for that. Yeah. I love that. And I do think you're right generally that there's been a crowding out so that we can't opt out, right? We can't, there is no space left. Mm. Although I'm not totally sure about that. I mean, I think, well, I don't know. I mean, so Peter Thiel's idea, and I know you hate this, and I'm no fan at all, but, you know, is seasteading, right? That we're going to we're gonna have these, he wants to establish right. these, like, yeah. independent, whatever they are, colonies in the middle of the ocean right. on They're floating platforms. Right, they like, medical tourism sites. Oh, is that it? I don't know. Yeah. That was, yeah. I met the guy, Friedman, Friedman? The, who was that? Was he the University of Chicago economist? Milton. Milton Friedman. Yeah. His David. Grandson, Fried I think. Or Pat. 
There's Patry and there's David, I think. Yeah, yeah, he's involved in that. He's yeah. one of the yes, that's leaders right. of that. Yeah, yeah I, I met him at a thing. So that's one idea about opting out, which I know you don't like and I don't like either um, because I don't want to live in the middle of the ocean with Peter Thiel. But... <laughs> The other here's another option. <laughs> well, here's another option. You probably won't see him around much. No. Yeah. Here's another option that I'll, you know that's been floated lately uh, mm-hmm. for opting out, which is Richard Spencer's, which is you you know a white ethno state that's outside the United States. It's their own. Oh, it's Jesus. their own place. I don't want to live with white people. <clears throat> but look at us, man. We're so pale. Like this is the problem. Yeah. We are so white. I mean, and, I'm just kidding. Um, I heard you once say that that was the thing you hated the most about your body or something. You're like that your your pale skin, and I was like, yeah, man, I know what you mean. Yeah, my my skin's white. All, all my melanin's in my teeth. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> I got like really tan teeth. I was imagine growing up in California in the 1970s. Remember when tanning was like the thing and having our kind of skin? It's terrible. Yeah, anyway. I'm, I'll probably die of skin cancer. I had like a, I had one of those lamps. Mm-hmm. For a while, Ooh. and yeah, just really? gave myself terrible sunburns. Oh, you burns. tried to get, sun, you tried to get tan. With yeah, because oh, wow. I wanted to look like an American Indian. <laughs> Wait a minute, pause. What was this? <laughs> I had this. Uh, I I was obsessed with American Indians. I bet, like yeah. from eleven to fifteen. Or oh, something. when you were a kid. Okay. Yeah, but that is the or that is the hippie origin story. You're right. I mean, most hippies start with the Indians, or a yeah. lot. A lot of them do. I mean, yeah. And you could say my entire life is just an, like an adolescent enactment of you know my childhood or something. But I think it's everyone's origin story. I mean, it is the origin story. We all started as oh no, but I mean, as a model, as an inspiration, right? A lot of that's you know because they were the back to the land allegedly and, yes, you yeah, know, close to the na- close to nature and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but you used a sun lamp yeah. to get a tan. <laughs> so the, right. It's all. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I would come home from school when I was like 11 there's something, or 12. There's like, it's a perfect encapsulation of something here. Yeah. You know, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. C- yeah. Civilizational and hypocrisy. <laughs> I would come home from school, uh, take off all my clothes and put on my loincloth. Wow. And wear my loincloth, which was a purple bath towel folded in thirds with a belt around it and i would wear that uh until i had to get dressed and go to school the next day wow yeah my brother wore a cape because (laughs) he was superman oh he wore a cape all day every day (laughs) until he was 12 (laughs) i'm not kidding and he kind of still does wear a cape even though he's 49 what's he do for a living plays um he's an it of course oh okay (laughs) And he's, you know, he's one of these gamers. He's like one of the original OG Uh gamers who Uh didn't like take advantage of, you know, the huge popularity. So he's still broke, Uh but he still plays the games. Right. These, um, you know, the, the fantasy games, the role-playing games, like Dungeons and Dragons. Like he plays variations on that and has since he was 10 or 12. But, you know, by the way, that I always think that's what you and I and people who do what we do basically are doing. We're playing Dungeons and Dragons. Like people who talk about politics who are obsessed with politics, who do it as a voc- as a vocation. It's like Dungeons and Dragons. Mm. Because the thing, because no, we are aliens, right? The rest of the world doesn't care about, doesn't even know, doesn't care about what we are obsessed about, right? When it comes to politics and culture and theory and intellectual stuff, right? I mean, I would imagine when you walk around in the real world, you feel completely alone, right? No one is talking about what you're thinking about or talking about. Am I right? Well, but the fact that there are people listening to this right now suggests that... Oh, thank God. But if we didn't have this, which is just a lucky accident for us, right? That it came along when we came along. But that's this loneliness also. There's another form of loneliness. Um, And Mm. I don't know if that's civilization's fault. In fact, I think it's not. But that's what I feel. That's the loneliness I feel. And thank God for my podcast and technology that allows me to talk to people like you and others who know what the fuck I'm talking about and mm-hmm. are interested in it. But that's a thing, right? We, we kind of operate in this universe where there's language and words and ideas and that's all we care about and that's all we think about and we obsess about it, just like Dungeons and Dragons players. Mm. When my brother talks to normies, right, outside mm. of D&D, outside of that world, he he often uses like references and words that are from the right. gaming world. And so people like look at him with this blank stare that I get when I talk about like the military budget of the United States, or I talk about the Yemen war, or I talk about the minimum wage or whatever mm-hmm. it is. Right. 
And I think that's got to be true for you, too, to some extent, right? I mean, I know you, you are actively, and this is one of the things I admire about you, you very actively, deliberately seek out other people to talk to who, you know, can relate to you. You go places to talk to them. You're mm. constantly cultivating that community of your yeah. own. But um, there is a weird, right? We really do live in this, I feel like I live in this totally, it's a bubble. Yeah, al although... I, I don't know. You're talking about things that are real. I mean, the war in Yemen is real. The oh, I know. The military budget is so that's, real. That would be the difference between my brother and me. Right. Yes. Yeah. The, he's interested in orcs, and I'm interested in, you know, trident missiles that right. can kill all of us right. in, you know, a minute. Yes. Yeah. So I, I don't know if I would describe, I mean, it's kind of self-righteous, but I, I would say that, you know, the world you and I are interested in is the real world. And unfortunately, and, I, and again, I'm not blaming anyone. I think that, I, I think it's interesting that people turn to artificial worlds so, with such uh, desperation. And I think a lot, look, I, you know, yeah. it's a big question. What do you dislike most about this moment in history? But I think the the biggest thing is that so many people are suffering so badly after centuries of progress centuries of progress so-called progress we're at a place right now where it's particularly in america people in this generation coming up are going to have less material wealth they're going to live fewer years they're going to their prospects are much worse than like you and i are from the sort of the last generation that that still was getting better mm -hmm. after us it's it's getting worse and worse these people are graduating now with debt from college yeah. i mean i i had a little debt it cost like 15 grand i went to an expensive school yeah me too now it's yeah. like 70 grand or yeah. something it's yeah. crazy and having a ba still kind of meant something mm -hmm. it doesn't mean shit now thank god <laughs> it's good it doesn't mean anything I'm yeah I, yeah I i'm mean, trying I, to get i'm trying to get rid of it entirely yeah I, and i agree i i support what you're doing what's it called renegade, renegade university renegade, yeah. yeah i think that's um yeah i think the american educational system is a scam but i think so many things in this country are scam and it's all collapsing so i do agree with you that i think we live in a really exciting moment and that big changes are coming and already here yeah um, but, uh, hmm. you know, I think it's, uh, I'm glad I don't have kids. I'll tell you that. Yeah. So education, higher education in particular, right. Is leaving much of the current generation in massive debt that they cannot ever get forgiven because right. it's illegal. Right. Um, there's general indebtedness in this country that is unprecedented, right? Yeah both individuals and the government are so in hoc it's way beyond anything in the in Where the does past that expression come from in hoc i don't know i have no idea because as you said that i was thinking all the chickens are coming home to roost mm. and you said in hoc it's not in h-a-w-k you know, h h o c k i believe h o c k i hawk, believe which is a part of a pig i think is it a ham hawk it's a farm term maybe. yeah Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe farmers owed pig well, parts. Well, here's, here's an idea. No, but hang on. And oh, then, yeah. so yeah, so, yeah, I'm 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 going to be Chris Ryan for a second. Okay. okay. So there's that, and I completely that is obvious, right? That you can't deny. That. I mean, just there's just this massive indebtedness, which gets to the unsustainability I was talking and, about. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And just just to service the debts, right? All those debts, both by private citizens and by the governments and all that, it's just it's horrible. You know, it takes a terrible toll on people economically. Then, and this is what I've been like actually drilling down into recently. I mean, of course I knew it basically, but like the, the military presence in the world right now, like what are the, what are the weapons that we have? Like even I wasn't super clear. So last night I decided to, because someone, someone said, um, I heard someone say uh, one, one submarine can wipe out like half a continent. I was like, really? One submarine? So it turns out it's true. Like one, there's, we have, the United States has 14 Ohio class submarines. Each one carries 24 Trident missiles. Each missile 
uh, breaks apart into eight different sub-missiles, each with its own nuclear warhead, each independently directed. So that's eight times 24 times 14. Each warhead can destroy an entire city, major city. So that number is something like 2,000. So we can, the United States can kill more than, can kill all the people in more than 2,000 cities in less than 10 minutes. The order from- Without from, even launching ICBMs. No IC, this is just right. the 14 subs that are constantly patrolling the oceans, right? right? So from, that's from the order coming from the White House to the explosion in a city, yeah. 10 minutes, right? So can it all come crashing down? <laughs> <laughs> it's more like when will it all come crashing down? So there you go. So those two things I completely agree with you about. Um, now, as for the the cause of those conditions, we I'm, I know we differ, but we completely agree that those are there and those are absolutely, I mean, in one case, it's clearly life-threatening, but in the other, it's virtually life-threatening, indebtedness, right? It's certainly life-diminishing to have to pay off debt, right? Um, so on the other hand, look what you and I are doing right now. It's remarkable. Sure, and it's, it's part of a it's part of a massive phenomenon that yeah, but is. But dude, that that's like that's like sitting on a southern plantation drinking mint and juleps <laughs> in eighteen you know fifty four and saying, yeah, you know, there's some suffering going on, but look at us, we're sitting well, here on the back porch on the veranda drinking mint juleps. It's like you and I are extremely, mm -hmm. as I said about the thing with India, like, you know, we don't think of ourselves this way, but we're extremely fortunate. Oh, we're rich. Extremely rich. Yeah. Even though, right. You know, beneficiaries yeah. of massive amounts of suffering mm -hmm. that, you know, all the all that juice gets condensed and sweetened and comes right at us. A couple of, you know, middle-aged white guys, pretty good time to be a middle-aged white guy. And we're looking around saying, hey, life's good. Civilization's great. Well, that's a very, very partial view of what's going on. You know, we're, we're at the bridge of the Titanic as it's sinking, saying, I don't know what everyone's screaming about. Things are fine right here. OK, here's a data point that I'm going to throw at you. And I'm it seems to me to be the biggest challenge to your thesis about capitalism in particular mm. and this has been ignored, meaning it has not appeared in almost any left liberal publication because I've, I've searched. So The Nation hasn't covered it. Mother Jones hasn't covered it. Huffington Post hasn't covered it. You know about the number of people in extreme poverty globally? You know about this. Okay. So since the 1990s, it's, it's the number, I think it's less than half, right? So clearly things are better. Am I right? for a whole lot of the very poorest people in the world. Well, here's the problem with that. Okay. Remember before I said um, having more stuff doesn't mean your life's better, mm -hmm. right? So what's being measured here is access to money. Do people have money or not? How much money do they have? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the world... Um, uh, uh, much less than ever, but a, a diminishing amount of the world, but still significant amount of the world, has lived outside of the money economy. So when we were talking about opting out earlier and how you can't do that in America because you have property tax, and so that requires hmm. you to participate in the money this economy. This is interesting. Okay. In places like Africa, Mozambique, where my wife is from, That's right. More than half of the country isn't even in the money That's economy. Right. That's a good point. So they're out there. They've got their chickens. They've got hmm. their land. They might hunt a little bit. They grow some food. They're living the mm -hmm. way they've always lived. Mm -hmm. So those people are now being pulled in to the money economy. So 20 years ago, they would have been seen as, you know, and there's the population of Mozambique is 50 million, 60 million. So it's big. It's a lot of people. So half of those people would have been seen as having no annual income, zero. Right. Now, you know, the, the, they can't live anymore. Maybe climate change, maybe because mining has opened up, maybe Chinese are buying up huge mm -hmm. swaths of Africa and they're being pushed off the land. 
being pushed into the cities, living in slums, forced to participate in the money economy. Now they're seen as making $5 a day, so it's an improvement. Is it an improvement in their quality of life? Fuck no. But well, how, from a, a statistical you, economic analysis, it looks like Do it. you know what they think about it? Do I know what they think about do you it? Think, do you know that they think what you think about their lives? No, I yeah, don't. Because that's, that's, a, that's dangerous, right? Yeah. To make claims about that. But I don't know. I mean, go to Shanghai and talk to the you know tens of millions of people who've been pushed off their family farms to uh you know beg on the streets of shanghai are are they happy or are the people in you know the 25 million people in sao paulo are they happy i do know that every time you know there aren't hunter gatherers running out of the jungle saying thank god you're here you know give us some clothes and a job they're all trying to stay away from us james scott wrote a whole book about that there are many books about many accounts first contact People don't want to join our world. And this is a very interesting hmm. thing that I sort of get into in the book. When you look at people who've had, who have knowledge of both worlds, mm -hmm. I mean, you know this, it, and maybe it's you who even told me this. There was a law in colonial America that whites were not allowed to run away and live with the Indians mm -hmm. because so many of them were doing right, it. Yeah. Ben Franklin it was wrote called about going this. native. Yeah. Yeah. You weren't, right. it was against the law. Yeah. Now, you don't pass a law against something nobody wants to do. Right. So they would hunt you down. Yeah. yeah and bring you back. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, the first chance you got, you'd like sneak off and go run with the live with the Indians right. again. Mm -hmm. Women who were kidnapped, their husbands murdered by the Indians in raids, live with the Indians for a couple of years. Then they get rescued. Yeah. And the first chance they get, they take off and go run into the woods again. Yeah. The fact is that people who know both worlds mm always choose that world mm -hmm. and that's living with people who are persecuted riddled with diseases you know they're living on the edge of starvation they still choose to do that mm -hmm. and there are a bunch of historical documents um, that that I cite in the book talking about that so I think objectively uh, there's a great book called don't sleep there are snakes by um, Daniel Everett who's a linguist who lived with the Pinaha people in the upper Amazon for about 30 mm. years. Hmm. And, you know, he, he talks about it. It's like, they're so fucking happy. <laughs> they're laughing all the time. And yeah. the reason they're happy, he says, is that they know how to handle the challenges that life throws at them. He says their lives aren't easy. A lot of kids die in, you know, child mortality is a major issue. Um, Infections can fuck you up, a, you know, a hunting accident, you fall, you break your leg, you can die from that. No doubt you're much better off in a case like that and, you know, go into a hospital or whatever. But the fact is that he says that they know what to expect from their world. They know what the dangers are. They know what snakes will kill you and they know what to watch out for. And when something comes, they know what it is. They've seen it before. They live in the world of their ancestors. They live in the world that they're evolved to live in. We don't. You know, we are, your kids don't live in the world that you grew up in. Your world is gone. My world is gone. It's gone in a year. I mean, we grew up without the fucking internet, right? Now that world's gone. So that generates extreme anxiety in us because we don't know what's coming. We don't even know what it looks like. It's like being in a dream where monsters just appear out of the shadows. We don't, how can we be prepared? We've never seen this world before. Mm -hmm. No one has. Right. And so that creates deep anxiety yeah. and a sense of unfamiliarity and like um, displacement. We live in a world that isn't our world. We live in a world in which the floor is made up of trap doors. Right. Right. I feel that. It's like the, the learned helplessness experiment, you know, with the dogs. It's it's a mm -mm. heartbreaking experiment. They they put dogs in cages that had um electrified floors. Hmm. And in for half of the dogs they would ring a bell and then electrify the floor, shock the dog, right? And there's no escape. The dog was gonna get shocked. There was nowhere to hide, right? And so they'd ring the bell, shock the dog, ring the bell, shock the dog, ring the bell, shock the dog. 
And so they got this conditioned stress response. And the, and the dogs uh, obviously were very unhappy. And then the other cages, they would ring the bell randomly and shock the dogs randomly. So there was no connection between the shocking and the bell. And then they, they looked and they shocked them the, the same number of times, right? And then they looked at, they studied the, um, the anxiety response in the dogs, and the dogs where the bell and the shock were correlated were fine. Hmm. Even though they suffered the same amount. Hmm. But the dogs, were, the dogs that didn't know when to expect the shock were destroyed. Totally fucked up. So you can say, yes, hunter-gatherers have a very stressful life and we have a stressful life. The difference is a fucking jaguar... They know they're jaguars and they got to watch out for them. And if a jaguar comes, there are certain things you can do and certain mm-hmm. things that won't work. You get audited. I get audited. I don't know what to do. I don't know. I get sued. I'm sued? I don't know. What do I do? Who do I call? I have no idea. I've never dealt with this. I've, I've never heard. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Right. There's so many things that can happen to us. Like you know, My car breaks down. I don't know how to fix my car. My fucking you know washing machine broke. Jesus, I don't know how to fish fix a wash. I yeah. don't know what to do. Yeah. So it's it's the difference of living in the world that created you. I mean, in evolutionarily speaking, it's the same thing with our bodies. They live in the world their bodies are made to live in. We live in a world, this sedentary world. We're sitting around on our sofas, driving our cars, you know, eating this food. Our bodies aren't made for this food. It's not made to live this way. So we suffer physiological distress. But we live longer. No, we don't. What? That that's a fucking Come on. myth. It's a myth. There there are several reasons that this false belief is uh, so widely spread throughout society. The main one is that statistically average longevity is significantly longer, but that's only because um, the people who died before 15 are included. Infant death and, and right. child death is included in the statistics. And it is true that among hunter-gatherers, almost half uh, of people who are born and survive the first couple of weeks of life die before they're 15. Okay. So there's a lot of... Um, and that's no good. Or... Do we not care about that? Or well, what? okay. <laughs> that, that's hard to talk about because a lot of the children who die are born um, with physical deficits. Mm-hmm. And in a hunter-gatherer society, if you can't walk and you can't see or you, you know, physically you have a disability, I guess we would call it, um, you're going to be a problem. It's going to be a big problem for the group and it's just not realistic. So those children are left out to die generally. Um, now, you know, we look at that with, uh, you know, sort of moral outrage, but a lot of abortions are of fetuses that are detected to be Mm -hmm. malformed or not developing, um, you know, normally, but we don't count abortions when we calculate modern longevity and life expectancy. So that is a statistical strangeness mm-hmm. that nobody ever talks about, but is relevant to this issue. Um, the other thing is that, so, so that's one thing. So you're looking at children that die and you're averaging it out with- Well, the, they also, the, sorry. I mean, I think you're onto something here that's really important and very powerful and going to be very controversial, but I think I'm with you on, which is that they simply thought of children differently than we do. Right. Well, and, there and, wasn't, and, they weren't yeah. these sacred objects. Who well, they're not be- even people. That's the thing. Infants aren't considered people. Um, mm-hmm. Many hunter-gatherer groups consider uh, personhood being achieved when you talk. That's what makes you a person. Before that, you're, you're an animal. You're, and, and I'm not saying that they don't suffer when an infant dies and that there isn't sadness involved, but it's not... It, they're not considered people. They're not given names, mm-hmm. right? And and this exists in the modern world as well. I mean, there are certain um, sects of uh, uh, the Judean culture, or I don't know, the, the, where I think it's ninety days you become a person. There, mm-hmm. um, I talk about this in the book. So, uh, and and infanticide in in Victorian England sure. in the medieval times was massive. Sure. Um, People thought differently about child death then than they do now. 
Right. Like almost universally. Right. They thought differently. Very and, and in Brazil right now, there, uh, there's a case, there's a research I was looking at where children that are born that seem to be insufficiently vigorous yeah. are often left In our to culture, die. it is a massive tragedy that you carry for the rest of your life if an infant dies. Then it just simply wasn't true. That right. wasn't the case. Right. Now, I take it you're a cultural relativist then. I am. Right. I'm not I don't I'm not gonna ever say that they were wrong and we're right about Yeah, you and I have run into this wall before. I I would say I'm a cultural relativist for most things, but Mm. there are some areas where I think it it supersedes that. But you are you are taking a cultural relativist position on this. Sure. I I think culture defines reality to a very large extent and this is one area where it does. Good enough. Okay. Um the other thing is that uh the way archaeologists measure the age at death of, uh, of skeletal remains is through dental eruption, it's called. It's how far the wisdom teeth have come out of the jaw. Hmm. And as you know, your wisdom teeth are fully grown in by your mid-30s. So in the notations on archaeological uh, findings, they will note the age at death uh, in five-year increments. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 35 plus. Because you can't really tell after that. So when journalists would read these reports, they would say, oh, look, nobody older than 35 was found here. Now, somebody may have been 70. They may have been 75 or 80. But the archaeologists can't determine that, so they just wrote 35 plus, over 35. Now, there's more sort of technical stuff we could get into around this. But the point is, the bottom line is that no human being in the last 500,000 years has been old at 35. 35, 40 has never been an old human being. Our species is evolved to live into our late 60s, early 70s. There, I get into this in several ways to death. There are all sorts of scientific ways to look at this. Um, so that's our, ne- that's our average natural lifespan, 68 to 72 years. So you say we live longer? Well, okay, yeah, what is it now? 81 in America, something mm-hmm. like that, if you're white. Yep. If you're black, it's significantly right. lower sure. than that. If you're in Africa or Portugal, or not Portugal, Brazil, uh, you know, India, it's significantly lower than that. So in those countries, average longevity does not uh, rise to the sort of nominative lifespan of human beings, Mm -hmm. right? They're actually living less. Well, that's because they're poorer would be the argument though, right? That's the explanation. Yeah. That's the common explanation. Right. Right. The richer you are, the the, the longer you up live, to a which seems to up be, to a point. Yeah. That seems to be basically true, though, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. But look at America. Mm-hmm. It could very easily be argued that it's not that our life lasts longer; it's that the process of dying takes longer. That, it, okay. See, that's actually where I was going. And yeah. It, yeah. Keep going. So yeah. modern medicine yeah. is not so much that it increases the years of active, vigorous, yeah. healthy life. What it does is it makes the descent slower. Yeah. It's like basketball where like the, the last two minutes can last half an hour because of all the timeouts and commercial breaks and this and that. So, you know, I, I have someone very close to me has been dying for about seven years now. That would never have happened in a hunter-gatherer group. If you, when you reach the point where you aren't a vigorous, active part of the tribe, or, or aren't even able to keep up walking, you die. Um, and you know, I, I was thinking about this. I was watching this uh, documentary about seals, or it's actually about the oceans. I think it was Planet Earth. Mm-hmm. And Richard Attenborough. Yeah, love it. And so it, it opens with these seals playing in the waves yeah. and, you know, and the frolicking. And, and then you see the shadow in the wave. And it's like, you oh, know, yeah. do, 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 do. Great do, scene. Do, 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 do. You've seen it. And it's I like, think it's the greatest TV it's show. It's either an ever. orca or a great white. I don't yeah. remember. Yeah. That comes up and like 
but hits the it's seal amazing. and the seal's flying through the air <laughs> and it's like ah waiting and the seal comes down and and Richard Attenborough says you know we slow this down to one thirtieth of normal speed so you can see the you know and, and the, the shark or the orca like bites the seal and the blood's running down and ah and then there's this old narration about you know the life is the eternal struggle for survival <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. And so I was like, well, wait a minute. I've hung out with seals in my day. Not a lot, as much as I'd like to, but I've spent some time around seals. And they seem to be pretty happy, relaxed animals. What the fuck? You know? So I looked up harbor seals, which I believe is the species that, that they were filming there. They live to be about 35. Hmm. So let's say that seal's 25. Let's say that seal was in the prime of life, which probably isn't the case because it's the older slower ones that are going to get you know statistically more likely to be attacked but anyway let's say it's 25 that seal has spent 25 years frolicking in the fucking waves eating sushi with his friends like lying on warm rocks taking the sun you know doing whatever seals do having a good time and then in a fucking heartbeat it's dead its death happened so fast that they needed to slow it down to one thirtieth of the normal speed so we can even see it. Mm -hmm. It's over. That's the ratio of good days to bad days <laughs> is really good in that seal's life. That's right. And that's the way I, I measure quality of life, yeah. right? That yeah. seal had one yeah. bad 20 seconds yeah. in his life. I know maybe he had heartbreak. You know, maybe there were times that, you know, maybe he was under the weather. But generally, that seal had a pretty good run. And yet it's being held up as this example of the ruthlessness of nature and how lucky we are to be sitting in our fucking double wide trailers eating our Fritos. It, it's just bullshit. Yeah. But anyway, that's Oof. yeah, that's my spiel. Well, no, no, I, I'm quite sympathetic to it. Um, and this, I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, in part because I'm now 52 and because I want to run forever. I want to be able to run and punch and kick and all that stuff forever. And I know it's, that can't be true, but I want it to go as long as I can. So, you know, right now I can do anything in the gym, basically anyone else can do, but I know that the, the clock is ticking. And also in the last year, or so I have a sore knee, I have a sore shoulder. I have, I've had in the last year, this whole thing with my whole abdomen, there's been maybe an infection, but shooting pains up through my abdomen and a bad back and just weird stuff in the groin area. That's basically made me miserable much of the time for the last year. It's probably related to my prostate in some way, but, um, and so, you know, age and I'm thinking this is what it's going to be, right? Like I can, maybe I can do boxing and kickboxing for another 10 or even maybe 20 or maybe even 30 years. In fact, there's a guy in my gym who's like 80. Um, do you but, beat him up? Huh? Do you beat him up? I don't mess with that dude. <laughs> you know, you know, he's OG, so I'm not messing with him. Um, but I feel like, yeah, you're just going to do it in a lot of pain. You know, you're going to eat that. You can do this. You can do this stuff at a high level, but you're just going to be dealing with pain a lot. You're going to be uncomfortable yeah. a lot. And I think that's true for a lot of people now. I think you're right, at least for now, that people are living longer, but they're living many, many years at the end of their life in tremendous discomfort or pain. Not and so, only and physical, so that the medical too, profession. Humiliation. What's that? What's that? Not only physical pain, but humiliation. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, I get you that. Know, you totally. got people wiping your ass. Absolutely. You got tubes up your dick. You got. You know, all, you're a shadow of your of who you were. What's I just someone I just heard someone say that the fastest growing profession in the United States is um, elder care. Yeah, well, and it will be for decades because the baby boomers are yeah. hitting that age now. So they can put us back together and keep us together. They yeah. can keep the machine going, basically. But you know, all the parts are going to be kind of like falling off and right. hanging out and not working correctly. Right. And what, where's the quality of life in yeah. that? I mean, uh, I hear Atul you. Gawande wrote this beautiful book, Being Mortal, uh, that came mm. out a couple of years ago. Excellent look at this. Um, you know, and, and he's, as a doctor, a neurosurgeon, I believe he is, he's talking about, uh, hmm. y you know, the keeping people alive longer is not necessarily what we want to be doing. I agree. Yeah. I agree. The way my dad went out, great. That's, yeah. the, that's as good as it gets these days, right? Yeah. Four days. My grandmother, on the other hand, it took her about 
a year and a half of lying in a hospital bed, staring at the ceiling. Yeah. It was ridiculous. Right. Horrible. Like, what's the point? Right. Plus the expense. Oh. Who's, who's paying for that? Something sure. like 70% of the budget uh, of healthcare in the U.S. is spent in the last year of people. I have lives. never witnessed misery like that. Yeah. That's, that is my, that is the, that's the nightmare for right. me of misery. Right. So when people say we live longer, that's what they leave out. They leave out the fact that that's not really living. That's keeping the body alive longer. Okay. But that's not living. Okay. So far, I think you're right. Okay. And we're not even talking about all the people with dementia. Are they even alive? I know. If you don't know, if you don't recognize your children, are you alive? Actually. So my father also had Alzheimer's, which didn't kill him. It had nothing to do with that, but he had Alzheimer's for the last two years of his life. And he was happier, much happier right. because, you know, his, all of his anger and rage and anxiety, yeah. just, he forgot about it. He yeah. forgot to be angry. Um, but, but no, I, I agree with you generally. However, so I mean, when I say you're right so far, I mean, historically. So, so far as a society, I think that is what's happening. I think that most people or a lot of people are living longer, but they're living these really, it's not worth living at a certain point um, in those later years. However, right. Isn't it possible that technology will come along that will just be able to replace my knee and my shoulder instantly for cheap? And I can keep doing all the things I want to do? Well, it already can replace your knee, right? Well, I mean, Lots like, yeah, but it's a big expense and it's, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't really work exactly yeah. right. But don't you think we can, I can have a bionic knee that's going to be even better than the one I was well, born with? Well, I, I think one of the paths, the potential paths forward is emergence of... Uh, the bio- biological and the technological, and that seems to be the the path we're on. Whether that will continue or not is debatable, but certainly that's that's one of the routes into a future that our species m- may take, may continue down. Whether or not the creature that results from that can be called human is an interesting question. I mean. To a hunter gatherer, we're not really human. We're <laughs> we're pathetically weak. Or we'd be gods, wouldn't we? To them, technologically, we'd be very flabby, weak, oh, um, yeah. ignorant gods from their perspective. I could outrun them. No, you, really, you wouldn't have a chance. Are you serious? Hunter, many hunter gatherers hunted by persistence running. They would run an antelope down till it couldn't run any further. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of that. In fact, that's one of the theories for why. But marathon runners we run so well. Marathon runners could outrun them certainly because they trained for that. Hunter gatherers didn't train for it. Hunter gather many hunter gatherers. Now, when we talk about hunter gatherers, of course, there are you know we're t- talking about Inuits and Australian Aborigines, sure. all and, kinds, you know, all kinds. So, um, you know, if we were going to cherry pick different, you know, hunter gatherer groups, for example, the Hadza from Kenya, mm-hmm. um, they would probably outrun. Not top flight marathon runners, but mid level. Um, but the point is, I guess you're saying that on average they would outrun the average oh, American, the, and that's probably I true mean, because I could outrun the average exactly, American. Well, yeah, yeah, like a, a yeah, you know, at least a rock could outrun yeah. the average American at this point, and that's the point, sort yeah. of, right? You know, I was so, also thinking, by the way, I was thinking yeah. the, the Costco in Salem, Oregon, where I go, you know, on a regular basis, right? That's your Costco. That's my Costco, yeah. and. um it's full of people who are not older than me in those uh, those wheelchair things. Yeah. Those buggies. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's There's the emergence of it's, technology that's and the biology. Most, one of the most depressing things, you know, people yeah. who are not old in those in those basically wheelchairs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I want I want that's bionic progress. parts, man. I want just if they can just replace all my joints with, you know, perfect titanium joints, I'm good. And cure Alzheimer's. Yeah. Then I'm good, which apparently they're about to. Did you see this? I think, you know, they're about to do everything. I know. They've been about to do shit for a long time. That's yeah. one of the things about getting older. You get this perspective and, and you realize that all these promises are just around the corner where they've been since no. I was a kid. No, a lot of them have been delivered. Like AIDS is essentially cured now. Yeah. That's big. Many cancers, most cancers are essentially cured or they are far from what they were in the past. Mm. There's a lot of cancers that were death sentences in the 1960s that people don't die from now. Yeah, I'd like to look at the overall statistics of how many people are dying from cancer now versus 30 years ago. 
I don't think hmm. there's a big difference. Hmm. It might take a little longer and cost a fuck of a lot more. I, I used to work in an oncology ward in, in Spain. I taught English to all the oncologists. And um, so I spent about five hours a week hanging out with oncologists. And one of them, Dr. Rubio, I remember him telling me that uh, the, the drugs that they were using were about 10 times as expensive as 20 years previously, but the effects were the same. And that really they had not made any progress. That what they were doing, and the reason they were more expensive is that the drugs went off patent, and so they'd come up with a new one and convince the health service to buy the new one because it was the new, better, blah, blah, blah. But the actual outcomes were the same. It was just more expensive. So I'm sure there there are cases uh, yeah. where some cancers are treatable now uh, in ways that weren't available 20 years ago. But in general, I'd like to see the overall numbers. I'm, I don't claim to be an expert on this, but I don't think it's as impressive as you think. I So I'm not an expert either, but I'm pretty damn sure that um treatment of cancer has is is radically improved in the last 40 years that there i know i mean i know people who have had who have survived cancers that were complete death sentences just a few decades ago right you may still be right about the overall death rate because but that would only be right caused by um increased incidence of cancer right that's what i'm thinking which could be true i mean right, i, I right. don't know if that's true i just don't know yeah. but that would be the only explanation because i mean that. it's kind of like you know you were laughing earlier about me using a sun lamp to look like an indian yeah. you know there's this weird cycle yeah. you know of hypocrisy and weirdness there i think you know if you look at the sort of life cycle of a cancer drug i imagine mo a lot of them are made in some pharmaceutical plant that spews chemicals into the air and water that are carcinogenic you know so that the process of making the drug to treat cancer is causing cancer mm -hmm. and i think that kind of weird spinning of our wheels is very central to the civilization well you process. and i are going to find out very soon about this because you know there's going to be listeners <laughs> attacking google as soon as yeah. they hear this which is good yeah, I, or I, we I, could attack it ourselves i look for yeah we're too lazy though because we're hunter gatherers <laughs> um so by the way i just for the record i do not think you're hypocritical at all for except when you were like except idiot. when you were 13 i mean that's obviously yeah. hypocritical but no I'm, I'm sure you get accused of this right i don't see i mean i'm right now i am staring at a very nice imac and a very nice microphone and a very nice desk chair so you use you know the instruments of, of modern civilization. But I know yeah. you've talked about this. It's like, yeah, what am I supposed to do? You know? Yeah. That's, that's always struck me as one of the dumbest arguments ever. Yeah. It, although it's one of the most common, you know, yeah. well, if you don't like it, why don't you like, I, I don't even, it, it's like, no. it's so stupid. It's like, it's like saying, you know, you have no right to, to um, talk about air pollution. If you breathe, mm -hmm. like, well, you breathe the air. Why are you talking like, like, what are you talking about, man? Well, now, if I lived in a fucking mansion with a helicopter and, you know, I well, mean, I think we can give Al Gore some shit for the amount of flying he does, we, maybe. We can give him shit for a lot of things, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, so you don't reject all parts of civilization, obviously. Well, I, don't, I mean, I, I like, live You don't in think we should live without, do you think we should live without the internet? Well, see, this is the thing. I think we live in the world we live in. So you can't. I'm not rejecting civilization. I'm trying to talk about civilization. I'm trying to look at it. I'm trying to, um, you know, have people see it in its entirety and think about it clearly so that they can pick and choose what works and what actually increases their quality of life wow. and reject the things that don't. So you don't see it as this, you take it or leave it proposition, which is the way it's presented, I think. So I live in the world as it is, of course. I've got an electric assist mountain bike. I got a computer and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not claiming to be the fucking Unabomber. And you take airplanes all over the world. I take airplanes. All the time. Yeah. You travel more than anyone I've ever known internationally, which is great. But, and I don't, 
care. I mean, to me, that doesn't undercut any of your yeah. argument. So, but I but, don't have kids. That's that's my yeah. ecological well, contribution to the world. Yeah, your 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 so-called whatever uh, carbon footprint or whatever is much smaller actually than most people's, right? right? And you're just by not having kids. Well, yeah, and you don't live in a mansion. You live very far from a mansion. Yeah. Um, but um, but so but wait a minute. You do want don't you want people to reject? at least some of civilization? Don't you want people to change sure. their minds? Oh, okay. Well, I, I want them to see that civilization is... You're not a, just saying... A conglomeration of Here's things. the deal, kids. Now you understand it. Take it or leave it, right? You're saying, no. No, no. Th- X, of course not. These things about civilization suck, and yeah. these other things, like the internet, are maybe okay? Or what... In some ways. I mean, I think podcasting is a great thing. Okay, so, I you, think so you want us to keep that. I think the fact that you and I are having this conversation and then you're going to push some buttons and thousands of people are going to listen to this with no corporation telling us what we can talk about and not talk about, yep. I think that that is a radical historical innovation on a par with the printing press. Amen. Yeah. So I think that's amazing. So what I'm saying is I'm. It, this is not about rejecting civilization. We're going to live in an artificial world. There's no way around that. Mm-hmm. And our children will and our grandchildren will. That's just the way it is. What I want us to do, we're going to live in a zoo. We're the only species that designs the zoo. It It <laughs> is enclosed within. Wow. So what I want us to do is live in the San Diego Zoo, not the fucking Calcutta Zoo. <laughs> now, I've been to both. <laughs> The uh, no, not just the San Diego Zoo. The uh, what's it called? Adventure Park. What's the one? Right, where there are no fences. Where it's just a big open field, and the giraffes and elephants just roam around in right. a big field. Yeah, right. right, yeah, right. But even in the zoo in San Diego, the bonobos, for example, there, there's no fence. There's water because bonobos don't swim, so they have them on this island, and there's water around it. And mm-hmm. I want us to design a zoo for ourselves that is based on an accurate understanding of what kind of animal we are and what is the environment that we're optimally suited to live in. Mm -hmm. And so we recreate that environment both physically and socially. Mm -hmm. So we, you want us to, to plan and build and live in the best possible zoo. Right. And do you, how clear are you about what that zoo looks like? I think I've got some pretty good ideas about it. I don't think I can tell you 100%, but I think, you know, myself and a lot of other people are working on figuring out what it looks like. We're, you know, there are a lot of people working in evolutionary medicine, for example. Um, and, and I think, you know, insights like this thing about longevity we were just talking about are important. Uh, I cite a, a back specialist at UCSF who I, I heard in an interview saying, well, the reason humans have, um, we have suffered from back pain is that the human body wasn't designed to live 70 or 80 years. It was only designed to live 40 years. And so, of course, the back suffers and da, da, da. you know, it's, it's uh, obsolete. And that's bullshit. So that, the guy's told he's a doctor, very prominent totally misinformed about the human body because he believes that we were only evolved to live 40 years. Hmm. Totally wrong. No, sir. The reason we have back pain is that our lives are full of chronic stress, Hmm. which the human body and mind is not designed to handle. We sit down all day long. We sit all day long, which is not a position that we're designed to Which I think is the main cause of my thing. Yeah, my abdominal stuff, yeah. We're sedentary. We're, you know, we don't sleep enough. We, you know, all this stuff, Mm -hmm. uh, our, our nutrition requirements aren't met or they're over, you know, too much of some sugars and all this. So there are people looking at um, designing this world from a medical perspective. Uh, Robert Sapolsky, who writes a lot about stress, why zebras don't get ulcers. He's very um, tuned in to sort of, okay, humans, what, what is the human, I don't want to say the body, the mind, the, the whole unit. What is a human being evolved to deal with in terms of stress? Well, acute we're, we're, that's what we're designed, you know, oh, what the fuck is that? Run. It's over. Relax. That's what, that's what our body's good at. Not, oh my God, you know, am I going to lose this job? Is she going to leave me? You know, or am I going to be able to get the kids through college? You know, not 40 years of fucking worrying about the same shit. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. You know, the, there's a, so people are coming at this from so many angles. Born to Run is a great book. Looking at the body. 
how running shoes. Oh, this is about the Mexican. Yeah, the Tara who run forever in bare feet. Yeah, yeah, right. bare feet or or sandals. Right. Um, and his whole thing is is showing how the the design of the leg is to run on the balls of your feet, your calf muscle. The whole point of your calf muscle is to absorb the shock when you land, when your foot lands on the ground. So when we, you know, Nike built these shoes with the big cushion and the heel and taught people to run with heel strikes, they were teaching them how to run against the architecture of the body. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, so that's when you design a shoe without thinking about the shape of the foot, or the biomechanics of the of the body, you know, we fuck ourselves up. And so we're doing that in so many ways. The nuclear family. Parents aren't supposed to be raising children on their own. That's you mean that's crazy. you mean that's not natural, Chris? What it's you, not natural. What kind of so hippie all are these you? parents are beating themselves up. Why am I screaming at the kids? Why am I so unhappy? I'm a bad mother. No, you're not a bad mother. You're just not designed by evolution to raise those kids by yourself. And so you're suffering. Well, yeah, I don't think, yeah, I mean, you know, I hate the, the nuclear family, but yeah. Um, so I, I like the zoo metaphor <laughs> and I like, I love the idea of, of analyzing everything and presenting it to the people, the public, you know, so that they can analyze these things better or differently or in a new way so that they see the world they live in in a different way. That's of course what I do, right? That's what we're doing. Um, in this alt media ecosystem that you and I operate in kind of the the Rogan kind of whatever it is you know Jordan Peterson Sam Harris you know that's kind of what a lot of us or us I don't know a lot of people in that ecosystem do they make a lot of recommendations uh all that's great I have no problem with it it's when and I haven't heard you go there yet but it's when people start to talk about um not just how people should live differently, but we need to think of ways to basically make them live differently, right? That's when it mm. gets difficult. Because as you know, most of the world doesn't agree with you at all. Well, right? most of the world doesn't have enough time or space in their lives to think about these yeah, things. Yeah, I mean, that's what like a Christian missionary might have said too, right? Once, they, once the people mm. read the Bible, then they'll see the truth, right? I mean, mm. I'm not, sorry, but I mean, it... You clear, clearly, you know, you have to change a whole bunch of minds. I mean, we all do, right? If you're a radical, out of the box thinker, which well, but see, you that, are, but I'm not trying to change anyone's minds. I, I, I don't really care. What? No, what? I, I'm not proselytizing. I, I'm what? not. No. Come on. <laughs> Sorry to Come disappoint on. you. I don't care. I mean, I write this because I think it's true, and people read it, and I hope it. So why are you so angry? I'm not angry. I already told you. I'm. I'm sad. I'm angry. So You're I'm not, angry. I'm Don't not, project it onto me. <laughs> Maybe man. that's all I'm doing. You're asking me who I hate the most and all this stuff. I, really? I, I'm not. I'm not feeling hostile. I feel okay. sad that people are suffering suffering unnecessarily. So I don't. I think in this conversation, I don't think you. There was much anger coming from you, but I have heard you. I think express a lot of anger, and you know, you've said yourself that you get criticized for being angry and being being a curmudgeon is sort of being an angry person right right but not at anyone i i i feel how about donald trump no i i, I really i feel um how about rich people i think donald, how about rich people no again see that that was what i was the point i was making before really? rich people are suffering as much as the poor people okay. okay that that's the whole point of that thing about you know um the social isolation and the you know all the what happens but you with call them money. assholes didn't you rich asshole syndrome yeah but we become rich assholes by being rich that that was my point that okay. that the wealth itself isolates them and hmm. and makes them miserable and so they end up being assholes often huh. um but okay. no i don't blame anyone for being rich i don't blame anyone for i don't blame people for anything i think my anger is at injustice and i think that injustice is a systemic thing and i feel that um the perpetrators of injustice are in important ways as much a vic as much victims of the system as the victims of the injustice okay and so hmm. yeah i don't i don't uh, it's not anger with me and it's not and i'm not trying to change the world i think the world is going to do what it does i'm just doing this because it's you know better than having a real job 
for sure. And and I'm barely getting through this book. I mean, honestly, I, I find podcasting to be so much more fun and satisfying than writing that hmm. I don't know how many more books I'll I'll spew out in my lifetime. I still love writing. I love podcasting so much I can't even tell you. But I do love writing. When I finally when I can actually steer my consciousness my my attention to the book and really get into it i love it and i get engrossed but man i do love this and i'm so so grateful that we can do this now um i'll tell you who's angry uh apparently a whole bunch of young dudes in this country mm -hmm. right i mean you were, we mentioned that that's the bulk i th i think i'm pretty sure of my audience and of your audience probably and the the alt media ecosystem certainly you know it's sort of this is well known what's going on like what what do you think what's the um you said it's the lack of the sacred for them or is this true for young men but why young men like why is it that particular demographic and by the way not it's young i'm pretty sure young white men yeah it's hard to tell with podcasting because so much of it is uh, podcasting is still so new yeah. that a lot of it yeah. is just like who knows what a podcast is and where to find it and you know who's like sort of tuned into it um and i think at this point a lot of it is you know younger people and and uh although i don't it's it's, it's also hard to know who your audience is because we don't get that data right you know we get download numbers which aren't even really reliable and themselves. then we get a bunch of anecdotal data and we right? get yeah. people who email us but and i mean stuff. judging yeah. from people yeah. who communicate with me and i'm yeah. sure you get this too right we get yeah. a lot of people who communicate and with also us. we both get a bump every time we go on rogan and those are mostly young men so i think that well we think again we don't know even he doesn't know for sure but it sure looks yeah. like it <laughs> it, it sure, sure looks, looks like, like it. it there's a definite yeah. um masculine yeah. thing going yeah. on right so i but i mean b beyond the technical doubts about that i think uh i think that there's a deficit of older men um speaking to younger men and i think a lot of younger men are looking for older men that they respect and who s talk about things in a way that that resonates with them and i think they're finding it in podcasts yeah the jordan peterson phenomenon is quite something isn't it and it's pretty mm. clear that that's what's going on don't yeah. you think I, I'm not as tuned into him as as a lot of people are. I, I I've seen like ten minutes of his shit on Rogan and some other stuff. He seems interesting to me. I don't really know. He seems angry, and and <laughs> anger turns me off. Yeah, he's honestly. very angry, and, which is fine. I mean, yeah, no, I I have all kinds of critiques of him, but actually, I mean, just just in terms of understanding the phenomenon of his popularity, right? His analysis is the same as mine, which he's is sort of anti social justice warriors and all that. Right. right. As That's I was going to say, by the way, that, you know, this alt media ecosystem I was describing or what Eric Weinstein or Stein describes as the intellectual dark web, you know, that you and I run in. Um, the one thing that unites all of us, because there's major differences among all of us, is we're all sort of anti-SJW. I mean, that's what kind of brought me into the Rogan sphere, and that's what, you know, we I think we all agree on that. We all hate the right. really stupid stuff coming out of 19-year-old mouths on college campuses. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, Peterson is certainly anti-SJW, and that's how he started. But he his big, his line that I think is his most famous line is this, clean up your room. That's what he says to people. And he says that that's the thing that really resonates with his audience and really changes their lives. And he has said, and I think he's right, you know, he talks a lot about order and discipline. And, you know, he, that, so he teaches the Bible because the, the Bible is about order and discipline and hierarchy and you know who's who and what's what and where's where and all that. It's an orderly house. It's an orderly world and then a universe. And his thesis is that, you know, that we're living in a world of chaos because of postmodernism, blah, blah, blah. I think he's completely off on that. But nonetheless, I mean, I do think that there's a lot of young men who do want a father figure. And I think he basically serves that purpose. He mm. he really comes across as like a preacher slash dad. You he's know, telling them to clean their room. That's tough love, kind of, or like a drill sergeant or yeah. a coach, which right. I, I get that because I actually love being coached. I mean, like when I'm in a gym, I actually love it when the, the coach yells at me and tells me to do stuff. Mm. Because in the rest of my life, I'm just sort of free floating and on my own, right. which mostly I love. And I would never trade that for anything else. But sometimes I just love just being actually a cog in a machine. You know, I won't want that for my whole life. 
but it's very appealing for yeah. times, you know, and, yeah. it, but, but there's something going on, right. That has created this massive audience for the stuff that we do. I mean, and I don't know exactly what it is. I mean, I think one theory is that that's the break, so-called breakup of the family, right. Which you and I are have, you know, different, we don't think it's all bad. Um, you said there's a lack of mentors, older mentors for young men. I don't know. I mean, how do you prove that? What's the evidence for that? Why do you think? Uh, well, I think, you know, the number of households in which there's not a father right, or even a father figure living in the household is much higher than it's been. Probably. Is that true for white people? Yeah, I think so. Is it? Yeah. I know it's true and for the black people. The divorce rate's massive. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, it's been had held pretty steady between 45 and 50 percent, I think, mm -hmm. you know, for first marriages. And right. then second and third marriages, it's much higher um, since the 70s, I think. Um, yeah, so I, I think there is that sort of casting about looking for someone. And I think the educational system isn't really providing it. Um, you don't say. Yeah. So I think that's part of it. And, and I do think that uh, there's a identity kind of feeling of, of people... You know, like I have people who, you know, come to me and say, you have to listen to, you know, Sam Harris. And Sam Harris is a big one. And I get that mm -hmm. a lot. And um, uh, and if I'm not like totally on board, like they really get disappointed. Oh, the tribalism here. Yeah. 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 And nothing against Sam Harris. is It's just like I don't really feel like I have that much to well I don't want to get into Sam Harris but it's not your your point is that my there's point a tribalism is it's not about Sam Harris identity and it's, tribalism yeah it's that yeah the, it's belong, not like belonging. like someone will recommend a book to me mm -hmm. and if I say yeah I, I got a lot of shit to read you know whatever right the, it's not a big they don't care that much yeah but if it's Sam Harris or Jordan Peterson or you know one of these other figures in the pantheon of podcast gods if if I have that same reaction, like yeah, well I'll check it out someday, whatever. They're like, no, no, you no now you gotta no you gotta listen to this now. It's really urgently important for them. And um, and if you say anything critical at all then, about them, oh you, you, you are get a yeah, piece of shit yeah fag yeah, yeah. you don't even know. <laughs> Anytime I see a comment or you know get an email that says you don't even. That word even in the first <laughs> sentence, I'm out. Or actually. <laughs> you don't even know. You don't even understand. You didn't even. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but there, yeah, there's a lot of like emotional. Yeah. Uh, it's family. Charge. To you know this. what it is? It's family. Could be. Yeah. That's how you respond when someone family, criticizes your dad. Tribe, yeah. When someone criticizes your dad. That's right. how you respond. Even intelligent people like you and me. Right. Kind, right. We don't yeah. love it when people criticize our dads. So right. We criticize all the time. Right. But it, from an outsider, right? right? And that's, I think, I think we just hit upon it. Yeah. They're finding a new family. Yeah. Jordan Peterson is their dad. I mean, really, he yeah. is. He's their dad. Yeah. Um, do you have any children? <laughs> I mean, you do. Me? You, I'm sure you have a lot of children in this way. Spread the yeah, yeah. right off. <laughs> yeah, the, the seed has been spread widely. But no, um, I mean, I'm sure yeah. you do have, you must have people who have a tribal identity. I guess. Uh, I, established I mean, I get, around I you and really, your podcast. I get really friendly, beautiful touching emails from people all the time oh yeah yeah so I'm sure but not all of them are, are so young either you know mm -hmm. there are a lot of, i mean i i got an amazing uh email or actually it was a tweet i think a guy a guy in his 40s i think um with a dust mask on his face and it was a photo of him and he said i'm listening to your podcast while i go while i go through the ashes of my house and I'm smiling behind the dust mask. Thanks. This was in Ventura. Wow. A couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Like it's it's just amazing. Um, and it's a weird thing because, you know, here you and I are. We we didn't prepare for this. We didn't like you know, write our script or you know that we just like hey how you doing? Turn on the mics. What's up? Talk for two hours or whatever it's been and. But well, there were, there was a little planning on my part. You just, well, don't, you just don't know it. But yeah, you okay. had to find your way here past the mudslides. <laughs> um, yeah. But you know, it, that's what I love about podcasting. That 
you know, there is work involved. Of course, you have to line up the interviews, you have to do your editing and you have to get to the place where the person is. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of work. Um, but it's not, it's not boring bullshit work. It's interesting. You get to hang out with people you want to hang out with, many of whom wouldn't have time if you weren't doing a podcast with them. And, Mm. and yet it's so impactful Mm. on the other side for some people that it's, it's really a beautiful thing. I'm, I'm it's uh, very happy to do it. It's taken my breath away many times. I get those letters too. I get emails often very much like that one. And it's like, I, I, you know, I sure assume that people would find it interesting, my podcast, right? Or otherwise I wouldn't do it. Right. But when I get emails or messages about, you know, people saying how it's changed their lives and they can be specific about it's how it's changed their lives. It's, I just cannot believe it. It's just, but it's, it is the most beautiful thing. It is the best thing about what we do. Well, I think that, right. I mean, that's, that that is the best thing, right? That is because people are isolated and there's no one like them around and they listen to a podcast and they hear someone like them they hear some resonance they're like that oh that's the kind of conversation i would have if there was anyone like me around here to have it with and so then it 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 reinforces the sense that they're not alone and i think that's the most beautiful thing about about this that there are people out there listening to this who are like fuck i could be sitting on the sofa having this being part of the conversation and they could I mean, we're not like movie stars or something. We're just regular guys having a conversation. And there are a lot of people who, if they weren't stuck in some little fucking town in the middle of nowhere, could be sitting here engaging in this conversation and have the same amount of insights and as we do. It and so there's a sense, even though they're not here with us, there is a sense of connectivity. Yeah, and I want and I want to say they really aren't alone in that moment, or at least as alone, right? And sounded like you were a little bit skeptical about that but i think well i just think that, that they get something that's that really yeah, is community it is meaningful but it's meaningful. not community in the sense of if you need a ride from the airport well, yeah. you know they're not going to call you up or yeah, me right? right or if you know they're sick and they need someone to bring some food over or well, take care of their dog you know that's a different kind of right community. but you know how you feel probably i mean i'm sure you know this feeling of like li- you listening to someone or reading something that you really makes sense to you and really is something that you've thought before and never heard yeah. anyone else say it's like whoa it's an inc- the right for me that's an amazing right. i had it last night i forget what it was. oh oh it was these french women and in, 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 oh right Catherine who wrote this Deneuve, letter yeah. about me the me too movement right. i was like i was crying by the end of that letter because mm. it was so exactly what i've been thinking for years and everyone's been screaming at me that right. i'm wrong and an asshole and a sexist right. and a misogynist um, so I do think that people, I, I, we've seen the evidence, you and I, you know, hundreds of pieces of evidence, maybe thousands in your case, you know, of people who say, look, here's exactly how you have changed my life. And it's right. God, <laughs> it's, it's great. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's enigmatic because I I don't ever feel like it's that big a deal from my perspective. Oh yeah, you know. Me so too. it's it's cool in a way that you're just sort of doing what you do, and yet it's still it's some there's some leveraging between here and there that makes it. Um, oh yeah, I didn't it, expect it at all yeah, ever. Yeah. So yeah, man. Well, look, I'll let you get back to nature because that's what you do, right? You just go rollick, Actually, frolic in the, in the woods in your loincloth. I, I wish, I wish, not today. No, I'm I'm gonna drive down to. Venice and do another podcast. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. Do my podcast. Okay. With a surfer who lives in his van, Cyrus Sutton. Really, cool. really cool guy. As I said, you're going to go back to nature. Yeah. <laughs> this is what you do. Just not in a loincloth anymore. No. Sweatpants. Ah. It's the modern the modern Indian. Mass produced in some sweatshop I'm in Vietnam. I'm a 55 year old dude wearing sweatpants. Good God. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. This was awesome. <laughs> yeah. And um, to do it. can't wait for the book keep you're gonna have to i know sorry about that (laughs) all right (laughs) all right thanks thanks ted this was the unregistered podcast and i'm thaddeus russell to sign up for the renegade university webinars visit thaddeusrussell.com slash courses to support the show and become a member of the unregistered community go to unregisteredlisteners.com thanks for listening